Welcome everyone to the Portage County Safety Council podcast. I am excited to be here as your host. My name is Nick Koya and I work with the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation in Portage County. I am excited to have on the show today with us um, Drew Hinton, for, uh, the president and CEO of Aero Safety. Drew, welcome to the show today. How are you doing? Good. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I'm excited to have you here. Um, you're just you're, it. you really have a vast wealth of knowledge and uh, I'm really <laughs> excited about this. But I know that just because I've met you before. Tell our listeners just a little about who you are, your background, those sorts of things. Yeah, sure. So like you mentioned, I'm the president and CEO of Aero Safety. We're a safety consulting training firm out of uh, Southern Kentucky. Prior to this, I've got 15 years of safety experience. I've worked as a global EHS manager for a chemical manufacturer, corporate safety director for a construction company. Um, but I like to also say kind of, I've seen kind of both sides of the fence. So in that same time frame, I've worked 12 years as a career firefighter, EMT, hazmat officer, all that fun stuff in Louisville, Kentucky. So, you know, I like to say that I've seen both, you know, when safety does work and when safety doesn't work and they're calling 911 and panicking. Um, you know, I've been around a lot of industries, gotten, gotten degrees and all that stuff. So um, looking forward to our discussion here. You know, I'm really excited about this discussion because I think it's an important piece uh, for organizations. Um, and, it, and the topic we're, we're, we are focusing in on today is how to evaluate your training programs. I mean, training really is an important piece uh, yep. of puzzle. You know, we can write the best programs in the world and document it every way OSHA needs us to, but that's not going to keep anybody safe. We got to take those thoughts, that legalese that's on the paper and get into the minds of our employees in a fashion that's effective for them. Um, so right. training, training really is important. So let's exactly. talk a little bit about that. You know, what's, what's your thought on training? Do you like to see more online training, in-person training, a hybrid model? What, what does that look like for you in your mind? I think everybody's, every company has a, a different need based on their training analysis. They do a training analysis to figure out what they're actually needing, what topics it is. And one customer, one company may work really well with a hybrid model. You know, they do a little bit of computer-based training and they do a little bit of hands-on training. Some customers and companies may work really well with um, completely all hands-on. You know, it all depends on the topic. If I'm doing a, you know, hazwopper training or hazmat training, for example, I need to be out there doing my hands-on stuff. There's and there's some OSHA letters of interpretations out there about specifically about hazwopper training, asking if computer-based training is you know sufficient. And they come back and say that that alone would not be sufficient. Now you can get some of the topics of that of that curriculum out of the way on computer-based training, but you would still need to supplement that with you know a, a site-specific on hands-on training to go over your your site-specific hazards, your equipment, your chemicals, processes, things like that. So um, you know, I think it's a it's a it's a topic that people tend to, at least from what I've seen, tend to take the the easiest route out with that. So if they say, hey, how much can we get an online OSHA 10 course for or whatever it may be, you know, hey, we can do it 50 bucks here. Let's let's do it online for 50 bucks versus, you know, bringing somebody in to do it for 200 bucks a person, whatever that whatever that cost may be. You know, of course, OSHA 10 is not actual training, but just to kind of give an example, like some people are usually looking for, in most cases, the easiest way out. They don't really do a deep dive and say what's truly going to benefit us in in and give our workers the best education, training, knowledge, and give them the skill sets to do their job. Well, and I think that's why we have to evaluate our training programs on a routine basis because things change. Um, let's face it, the workforce has drastically changed over the past five years. Um, exactly. We're seeing more of those baby boomers on their way out. We're seeing younger generations come in. And there's different expectations generationally about how we best learn or how we want to interact with that training. So now is the time for companies to really be evaluating that training program. Um, and I think one of the first places we can take a look at is our trainers. Do we have trainers in place that are adaptive enough that can work with the different generational and learning needs? Um, or are we just grabbing, hey, guess what? Your HR and safety is yours. So you got to do it. It doesn't matter if you're good at it or not. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's, and this is as far as your training program as a whole, I think this is one of the key things that's overlooked more often than other aspects is the trainers. You know, we don't even, even if we're the only trainer in the facility, are we truly evaluating ourselves to make sure we're still up to par? Right. So as we, as we, you know, we go through the standards there, there's a few social standards that will specifically outline you know, trainer requirements. So, you know, Hazwopper, powered industrial trucks, a few, you know, bloodborne pathogens, 
few of the standards going to have trainer requirements, but where you really start getting into some good, um, good knowledge and good requirements and what I like to refer as job performance requirements, kind of an FPA terminology is those cons are those consensus standards. So NFPA and C things like that, they're going to a lot of times have trainer qualifications. And so, you know, I, I can always think back to, you know, being at a, pro a professional development conference, I think it was an ASSP regional conference. And this gentleman next to me, he was probably in this, probably in his you know, early to mid seventies. And he asked me, he said, Hey, do I need to come to these things? He said, what do you think? Do I need to come to these conferences all the time? I said, well, what do you, what do you do? What do you do? He said, well, I'm a consultant like you. I see. I said, you know, he said, I'm doing training. I'm going out to customers, doing audits, all that stuff. But he said, I've been doing this thing for, you know, 40 years. You know, do, we, do you think I truly need to do this? I said, absolutely. You know, as you mentioned, you know, the workforce has changed, but also with other hazards have changed. You know, if I've do, if I had, you know, and for if he went 40 years without ever doing a, any kind of professional development, he's teaching some really old stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are some things that we got to make sure that we're familiar with what we're training. It's, it's you know, you can kind of get in the trap of doing some of the, you know, the train the trainer courses that really just give you a certification, but it doesn't really verify that you've got the right, you know, the requisite knowledge to train on that. And I like referring to people that, you know, there is an OSHA letter of interpretation dealing with, powered industrial trucks that hits on this topic and i think it's a really good one that it asks if you know who can do powered industrial truck training you know what are the qualifications for the trainer and, and kind of in a nutshell they said if you haven't been there or done that you're not qualified to train and so you know i think the example they gave you is if you're trying if they're operating a certain forklift attachment that you never operated yourself then how are you qualified to evaluate them operating that properly you know sitting through an online class through you know, any of these major equipment manufacturers or rental companies, things like that, you know, you can do all these online train the trainers and certify me.net and all these other companies that you can pay a, a hundred bucks and become a authorized trainer or a certified trainer. Um, but, but that definitely doesn't meet your prerequisites. So like, for example, like when we do a, a train the trainer course, you know, we make it a prerequisite that you've had to you know operate that equipment or have that basic course, whatever, whatever topic it is, you know, if you're, teaching a fall protection train the trainer you've got to be a competent person already and then right. we're going to teach you training fundamentals we're going to teach you the ins and outs of the standards so that you are the go-to doesn't mean you have to know every single in and out of that standard but you at least know how to reference it and find those answers on that you know but we don't we, we tend to not look at ourselves inwardly and say you know am i still qualified as a trainer you know and there's multiple routes to evaluate that you know some people i'm, I'm kind of on the fence about the effectiveness of kind of post uh, training surveys and evaluations because sometimes you get some really good answers and sometimes they just tell you, Hey, the training sucked because you didn't bring donuts. Right. Oh, that's <laughs> so, my favorite. I get that at every training. Why didn't we have, you know, free food? We're, we're the state. Yeah. I can't provide you free food. <laughs> you know, the seats are hard or terrible, whatever it may be. It's too yeah. cold. Um, so some of that, sometimes they can be very beneficial. So I've seen it there. I've seen the, where they're more beneficial, like the major conferences, so, like, you know, if you go speak at an ASSP conference or a National Safety Council or things like that, you know, uh, you know, Ohio Workers Conference coming up in, in pretty soon, you know, things like that, they're going to give you that feedback and they're, and people are, are going to learn. So they're more apt to give you more honest feedback versus, you know, not to say that the workers don't care, but typically the in-house workers are not going to take you as serious as other safety professionals are that are in our same field. Uh, so we can so we can potentially look at those post evaluation surveys. But then, you know, if I start seeing a trend of of issues in, um, you know, workplace incidents, injuries, and I just went over that topic, I need to look back. Did I am I qualified? Did I teach them the proper way? You know, they, I think the way it's worded them in the global patching standard is that the training is done by somebody that's knowledgeable of the topics in your workplace. Right. So did I was I, you know, going through and just telling you. Hey, here's what our bulbar patching kit contains, or am I showing you the proper way to take gloves off based on some medical research, all that stuff? I mean, something as simple as that can go a long way. You know, and I think the other aspect of it is we need to have the technical knowledge, but there's some people that have great technical knowledge, but delivery is not there. And I Absolutely. really think we got to evaluate our delivery and are we meeting the needs? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. I, I spent a lot of time with the Toastmasters program. Um, I yeah. enjoyed it just because it was a safe place to try new training techniques kind of in a condensed area before I took it out to the staff. But we really, we not only need the base knowledge, but then you have to be 
charismatic and, and have a way to deliver it that's going to engage people and keep them yeah. attuned to it. Because I'm sure you've been in some of those lectures before where they're monotone. They're the most knowledgeable person. But about after about five minutes, we've gone to our happy place. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's like you said, it's all about delivering it in a motivational flow and getting people engaged with that. So absolutely, I, I can have all the knowledge in the world, but if my presentation skills are just awful, then you're going to be out. You know, I, you know, I kind of joke around people on social media a few weeks ago. I sat in a professional development conference and the guy sat behind one of the sessions I sat in, sat behind the computer the whole time, never got up, just read word for word the slides. I'm like, well, I could have. I could have read this myself before I even came to this meeting. Um, so, you know, Toastmasters is a great program out there. I mean, I've, I hate, I, I truly hate doing it, but I do it, you know, just to just try to help through myself. But I'll sometimes record my classes and then go back and sit there and watch myself and say, you know, how many, how many filler words did I use? You know, did I say, um, or, you know, whatever other word it was, I said it, um, 27 times, or I got my hands in my pockets playing with my keys or whatever that may be. So I'll look back and see, you know, how is my presentation skills? So, you know, it's it's kind of a tangible thing that we can figure out, you know, go to these professional development conferences or go to the, whatever professional development it is and determine that, hey, I've got this, I've got the knowledge. But, you know, like you said, either going to Toastmasters where you kind of evaluate each other or recording yourself, we need to evaluate how's my presentation skills. And sometimes you'll get that on the feedback, but other times you won't. You know, self-recording is one of the most useful self-evaluation tools that I've had. I, uh, I had the opportunity to go through a two-week training program here in the state years ago um, through the Ohio Peace Officer Training Academy to teach academy classes. And that was a big part of it is they did a 30-second video, a one-minute, a five-minute, and a 10-minute video of our presentations. And then you had to go in this other room and watch it on the big screen. You know, it was this 100-inch <laughs> screen watching yourself. And the evaluators were in there with you and you had to evaluate yourself. It was painful, but I learned yeah. so much about myself. Uh, and, and I think it's a tool that you can implement into how you evaluate your tra training programs and yourself. Yeah. I mean, I can, you know, my first thing out of high school was I, I was a diesel mechanic and I went to Nashville Little Diesel College. And I can remember to this day sitting in a class, there was a, it was a, just like we're talking about, this instructor professor was one of the most knowledgeable guys. He was in his seventies. Like he had been doing it for 50, 60 years and one of the smartest guys but I remember one of the guys sitting in the back of class and he's sitting there counting how many times I think it was, um, he was counting how many times he said, um, and he got done with the class and he's like, Mr. Whatever it was. He's like, did you know that you said, um, 76 times, <laughs> just, <laughs> just calls him out. <laughs> but that's, oh. you know, that's things that we, we don't want to, we don't want to find out, but you know, in publicly, but we want to, like I said, record our videos, go to Toastmasters, whatever it is. And find out that, you know, like I said, we're using those filler words or have our hands in our pockets the whole time or we're, we're you know, my, my big pet peeve is turning our back to the audience. Right. So shouldn't be sitting there turning away, looking at the screen and then turning back to the audience. I want to keep them looking at me, just have a few a few bullet points on the material on the slides and then keep them engaged and talking to me. You know, that really leads into the second piece of your training evaluation is what does your content look like? We've all been in those classes where they have two, 300 words on each slide. It's the small print. They're reading it word for word. <laughs> and, you know, the content breaks into two categories. What are we delivering with and, and are we updating our material? So let's yeah. kind of start with what are we delivering with? Personally, one of the best classes that I've ever been in was the individual had PowerPoints, but it was only four slides and each slide was a photo. It wasn't even a photo of a workplace. It was just some inspirational piece that added to his presentation we often use it as an aid to get us through the presentation when really yeah. it should just be something to make the presentation better not to guide us through our, through the knowledge that we should have so you know what's your what's been your experience with that and evaluating those pieces yeah and i think this is a critical aspect so like we a lot of companies have a tendency we'll go through once a year we'll evaluate our our written programs and policies and procedures but we tend to not incorporate our training program we assume that year after year we're going to have the same same topics but like you said things update things change especially consensus standards you know for example like right now i'm in the process of updating our our art class training because they just come out with the 2024 nfpa 70e standard so i'm going through that making sure that it's you know, hey what's what's changed and then i make sure that if i have changed something I'm making a keynote either on the screen or to myself somewhere. That way, if I've went through that, let's say I take a class to a customer that I taught them three years ago, I taught them, let's say the 2021 standard, and I'm going to teach them later this year, the 2024 standard. It's going to help me out and help them out to say, 
hey, I'm teaching the 24 to 24 to 2024 standard, but here is what specifically has changed. That way it gives them an idea, kind of highlights those specific key differences because they go through and just say, okay, you know, it's 24, 2024 standard, but it's all, it's all going to be the same thing. I just I do this every three years. But if you highlight what are those big, big major changes and major uh, key implementations of that, th of that standard, that helps them out as a student, but also you as an instructor. So we can go through our training program content and, you know, I, I like looking at, again, I mentioned earlier, those, what they call JPRs, those job performance requirements. And so NFPA is really big about this. Like, I, you know, coming from the fire department, I, you know, I, I pretty much learned NFPA way before I learned OSHA. And so, you know, I, they have what those JPRs and it. And so, for example, like I'll use this example because I'm getting ready to do a conference on air monitoring or a presentation on air monitoring. And so they call it a gas tester. So if you look at like confined space standard, they're called the, the person doing the testing is a gas tester. And they'll say, here is your requirements for knowledge, you know, things that you have to know, and here's your co competencies that you have to be able to demonstrate. Now I can take those and then put, make sure that my training material encomp encompasses all of that. Make sure my training material covers, okay, how to, for example, to stand on topic here, how to change out a sensor, how to identify the different, different types of sensors, how to interpret your readings, how to, bump, how to actually physically bump test, calibrate, you know, fresh air set up all these different things. And so if we're going through our material, you know, one of the, you know, the worst things I hate, I hate hearing is, Hey, we're using something that the previous safety manager was using. Right. So we, whether we think it's accurate or not, you know, it, we still have to evaluate that. It, it can sometimes be a trap. You know, maybe that person was super knowledgeable and there's a really good program or maybe it wasn't. And we're just being too lazy and we're not updating it. We're just going to say, ah, I don't want to spend the time updating it, so I'm just going to go with this because why? Why reinvent the wheel, right? So, but we may be teaching them the exact, you know, the absolute wrong things out there, and then we're continuing to instill that negative, that negative training, that negative thought process, and negative skills in there, which could ultimately lead to an injury illness. You know, and I really think that we we need to do the valuations because number one, one of the big complaints I hear from customers, I hear from. Uh, the employees on the front lines when I'm in the facilities is we're just tired of going to training because it's the same thing every year. I've seen this same video 20 times. I've been here for 20 years. We don't update. Yep. We're not dealing with that. And I think the other piece is it needs to be relevant. There's nothing worse than working in a bakery, right? An industrial bakery. And I'm watching a video that deals with a, st a steel mill. Like yep. does the content relevant to the work environment too, or to the gas meter example. Hey, here's a gas meter. Here's how I fix it and work with it. But we don't use that model here. We use a different brand. Well, yeah. that doesn't really do me any good. Yeah, that's that's one thing that I always try to focus on, you know, in the weeks or months leading up to a training with a customer is, you know, for example, if we're doing confined space training. Hey, tell me what kind of meter you have. You know, what kind of space you're going into. Hey, we're going into manholes or we're going into tanker trucks or you know, sump pits, whatever it is that way. And, and, and I'll always try to, if possible, Hey, can I come up there a day before and snap some pictures of your work site? So I can go ahead and put that in there. Like you said, make it relevant to them. If they're, if they're in construction industry, don't show them some chemical plan or something completely irrelevant to them. It has no, no bearing on what they're doing. Um, but just as you mentioned, going through periodically, even changing those pictures, updating those things, because like you said, if they've been through it five times, I don't want I don't want them sitting through a class that they could teach me back because they've already been through it. Right. So as we kind of wrap up this discussion on our training evaluations, what are what are three things that you would want a customer to do today if they had to go evaluate their their program? What are three points you want them to focus in on that they can take away from this presentation today? So one thing is do a training and out training needs analysis and then kind of encompass with that as your gap assessment. So figure out what does my company need as a whole? What training does my company need? And then as part of that whole training needs analysis is, is a portion of that is your gap analysis. So, okay, we need this. Now, what do we actually have in place? And what's, of course, what is our gap? What do I need to put into place? So that identifies to make sure that you at least have something in place. And then you can start building from that, you know, identify your deficiency builds from that. You know, two is, is make sure that we're looking at our, you know, especially, like I said, our first topic, our trainers, right? So are we evaluating ourselves, continuously investing in ourselves as trainers and doing continual development? So not just taking train the trainers and calling it a day. You know, we, you know, there's been plenty of times where I'll sit through a class, 
you know, that's somewhat seemingly basic because I want to make sure that I'm not forgetting the fundamentals of these things as a, as an instructor. Right. So, and then set, and just set it up on a, you know, third thing is just make sure that we're uh, setting it up on a routine schedule to evaluate. Like I said, we have a tendency to evaluate our, our policies and procedures pretty frequently, but sometimes we forget to look at the training program at the same time. So make sure that we're incorporating the training program into our, you know, annual or every six months review, whatever, whatever periodic schedule you have on in place. That way we're making sure that it's up to date. It's, it's still catered to our, our customers, our clients, our, our own workers, whatever that may be. And then we can continue to build off of that. Thank you. I mean, that's great information. I appreciate it. I think our audience is really going to appreciate it. It's going to get them moving in the right direction. In the meantime, if they have some questions, uh, how do they reach out to you? How do they get a hold of you? Um, social media is the easiest way to get a hold of me. I'm on LinkedIn is probably my most uh, most active content. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram, whatever it is. And you can always go to our, our website, uh, aerosafetyus.com and uh, get, send us an email. I'll be glad to help out any way that we can. All right. Well, thank you again so much for being on here with uh, Portage County Safety Council. We appreciate your knowledge and information as always. Uh, we look forward to speaking to you at the next time. Have a great one. Perfect. Thank you. You too.